Just turn around and leave me The tear in my eye drops on the floor Alongside my spear My knees are dry Okay, we're going to get started here in just a second. I never prayed to God. Get started a little late tonight. I'd rather no one heard. Redemption, I have waited for you to come and drown all my sin. My knees are drenched in the blind. I feel just to get it. Oh, close enough. Okay. Hello. Good evening, everybody. We are going to continue on with our Forbidden Science. Oh, nothing else to be said but to just jump on into it. Kick back here. So we're starting into part four of the book. Oh, part four. Um, spiritual Science. And we'll see what that entails. And our first article, um, if you didn't hear me say it before or you've forgotten, these are articles compiled from Atlantis Rising magazine. Um, I think this particular compilation is all stuff from 2006 and earlier. Maybe two th oh, copyright 2008, so 2008 and earlier, probably 2007. So, anyway, so some of it can be slightly dated. So we're on Article 17, the sensitivities of water. Starling New Evidence that Water Can Reflect Thought and More by Gene Manning. Does water record the thought the themes of our thoughts and feelings. Do water crystals dance to Mozart and fall apart when subjected to heavy metal lyrics? Can water reflect the power of unconditional love and mirror the effects of gratitude? A researcher in Japan believes he has photographic proof of water possessing such sensitivities. Dr. Masaru Imoto studies the microscopic architectures of tens of thousands of water crystals. When healthy water freezes, it creates crystals, solids with an orderly internal structure. But the ability to create crystals can get knocked out of water. Emoto says, sees those structures as influenced by human activities and intentions. He sees physical proof that our thoughts, human vibrational energies, affect 
our surroundings. Further, he sees that music and even pictures affect the molecular structure of water. Emoto visited British Columbia recently, uh, told his story, and presented new information he'd learned after the publication of his book, Messages from Water, of dozens of extraordinary photographs. He had received a doctorate in alternative medicine from the International Open University in Sri Lanka in 1992. His background is as a healer who treated more than 15,000 people and as an author of a dozen books about subtle energies. Emoto first turned toward researching water after meeting with Dr. Lee H. Lorenz Lorenzen, Lorenzen, who had studied biochemistry at UCL, UC Berkeley, uh, developed a type of water called magnetic resonance water to heal his own wife's health problems. Through Lorenzen, Emoto got his hands on a machine called a magnetic resonant, resonance analyzer, MRA, that was said to measure chi. When speaking of chi, Emoto uses the Japanese word hado, meaning the world of subtle energy related to consciousness. It's also called ki in Japanese. But uh, Back in Japan, Emoto says he learned that hado water produced by L Lorenzen at Emoto's request improves people's health. His patients, families, his patients' families could see the improvements, but skeptics scoffed at the suggestion that water could hold and impart health-enhancing information. Who has, who has seen Chi? What does Hado look like? To show the skeptics that what Sorry, to show the skeptics that what was happening in the Hado water was more than merely imagined effects, Emoto wanted a tool or method for measuring differences between one type of water and another. In 1994, he read a book that started him thinking about how he might be able to find such a method. The book noted that even after a few million years of snow falling on Earth, as far as scientists can find, there aren't any two snowflakes that are identical. This led Emoto to ask if freezing water samples would be a way to see information held by waters subjected to different influences. He knew that homeopathic dilutions continuously hold information about molecules of substances that had been added to water before the molecules were diluted out of the water. However, it would have it would have been difficult for him to study homeopathically imprinted waters because homeopathy is not officially allowed in Japanese medicine. He decided instead to begin his experiments with pure waters. Freezing droplets and photographing the resultant ice crystals individual, uh, individually turned out to be the easier to be easier said than done. They had to be seen under a powerful microscope and photographed at high speed before they could melt. Nevertheless, he per persevered in developing a technique for clearly photographing crystals at s magnifications of between 200 and 500 times in the 90 seconds before they began to melt. The technique included building what was in effect a large ice box in which his staff worked for up to 15 minutes at a time while dressed in dressing in parkas for a minimum for, for I'm sorry for a minus 5 degrees Celsius 23 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures really 15 minutes at a time that's not that cold Emoto laughs at himself while admitting he can't take more than a few minutes of such temperatures and therefore had to hire out the actual photography he then enlarged the photos into slides and showed them to his students who were fascinated in what they saw. For instance, one sample of snow fed, snow fed spring water from Yamanashi Prefecture gave a symmetrical hexagonal six-sided crystal with three branches stretching out from each edge, giving the impression of people holding hands together. Okay, and he's got a pic. There's a picture of him holding his book, Messages from Water. Uh, renowned author and healer, Dr. Masaru Emoto. So, there's his book with the snowflake on the front. Quite an interesting one. 
In contrast, exposure to chlorine has a shattering effect on water crystals. Emoto's students soberly concluded that since life on Earth depends on water, the life source related the the life force related quality of water in any given place must have a tremendous effect on the environment. Emoto's associates sent him samples of water from various parts of the world, polluted rivers and holy sites, various cities and mountains. His staff took many photographs of each sample, although individual crystals from one water sample differed incrementally, crystals from any given sample were similar. Unpolluted water samples yielded symmetrical hexagons, but when polluted water droplets were frozen, the photographs revealed an inability for crystals to reach complete hexagonal structures. However, most samples went through a common stage when the ice droplets melted. Just before ice turns to water, a shape could be seen under the microscope, which is a replica of the six lines inside a circle constituting the Chinese alphabet's character for water. What caused the apparent weaknesses, weakness in the water's hidden structures? The problems correlated with whether with whether a water blah, sorry the problems correlated with whether a, a water had been exposed to chemicals emotional pollution panic pervading a city after an earthquake destroyed the water's crystalline abilities and sound pollution in later experiments emoto put the water samples between loudspeakers and exposed them to certain recordings before freezing the droplets when music lyrics contained aggression, such as I hate you or you fool, the water not only could not form proper crystals under the microscope, it had a chaotic appearance. On the other hand, uplifting music such as Mozart's Symphony No. 40 in G minor and Beethoven's Pastoral um, yielded beautiful, gracefully formed crystals. This line of research led to placing samples of water on certain photographs, including labels with words written on them and having school children verbally give messages to the water samples. Although healthy waters form a myriad of variations on hexagonal crystals, Emoto was in for a surprise. One of his one of his before and after sets of photos showed inadequately formed water crystals from a sample of Fujiwara dam waters before a minister prayed over the dam. Waters behind the dam became stagnant and the sample under the microscope becomes stagnant, sorry, and the sample under the microscope looked like a suffering face. However, af the after sample was taken after Reverend Keito Hoki, chief priest of Jehuin, I know I'm butchering this, Jehuin Temple, Omiya City, Omiya City, performed a prayer practice for an hour beside the dam. Among the exquisite hexagonal crystals obtained from the water after it was prayed over were two heptagons, crystals that were seven-sided. Increasingly, the reverend had, interestingly, sorry, the reverend had prayed to the seven goddesses of fortune. Emoto's research indicates that troubled tap water that cannot crystallize properly can be transformed to make beautiful crystals through conscious thought focused on love. He learned that the most powerful combination of words are love and gratitude. His recent experiments indicate that electromagnetic pollution can be eased if the words coming over the cell phone or the television are harmonious, such as a telephone call between lovers or a TV program about nature. Political debates in general had a negative effect on the water's abilities to crystallize. Interesting. Okay, there are two pictures here. I'm going to go ahead and read the caption and show those, and then I'll finish this page. Figure 17.2. The photograph on top is of stagnant dam water. The photograph on the bottom is dam water after it had been exposed to prayer. Photographs from messages from water. So... There you go. Top, stagnant, bottom, prayed over. If water carries messages about intentions, whether loving or angry, 
of those who handle it, what does the, that fact mean in our everyday lives? Until a variety of scientific studies are done, we can only speculate. We've heard tales of houseplants dying when their home became a marital battleground, and conversely, plants thriving under the green thumb of a gardener who loves growing them. Perhaps water inside the plants instantly registers and records the powerful emotions emanated in their environment. Uh, were the mysterious giant cabbages grown in the early days of the Findhorn community in an inhospitable corner of Scotland, partly a result of influences upon the water fed to them? A member of the Findhorn Foundation who recently visited British Columbia said the abundant growth of that garden had been a demonstration of what happens when humankind cooperates with another realm, nature spirits. But perhaps water was part of the mechanism for manifesting the demonstration. Water could have been transmitting the purest intentions of the humans involved. The experiments of scientists such as Stanford University Professor Emeritus William Tiller, PhD, indicate that our intentions have measurable effects on physical objects. Is water the most sensitive medium for recording and transmitting subtle influences? If so, the implications for our health and the health of our environment are profound. The fertilized human egg is about 95% water and a mature human body is 70% water. We live on a planet whose surface is about 70% covered with water. Emoto has presented his findings to audiences in Europe and Japan. In England, he met with Rupert Sheldrake, PhD. Emoto says he was asked by Sheldrake to do experiments involving people in jail to see how the water influenced by people who are criminals or are generally in a negative state of mind differs from influences of people in other sectors. Like all pioneers, Emoto's work will surely run up against mental blocks, but since it is self-funded, at least it won't be shut down, as Dr. Jacques Benveniste's laboratory was when the French government pulled his funding after his research seemed to vindicate homeopathy. What seems to be needed now is for rigorous, double-blind scientific experiments, impeccably designed attempts to either replicate or refute Emoto's findings. However, Emoto wonders if the Western scientific model is capable of the job. When dealing with something alive, such as he believes water to be when in a state of health, there is no such thing as an exact replication. Like snowflakes and human faces, he says, water crystals are creations of a myriad of influences and there will be no two identical. How do you replicate the scenes in a kaleidoscope? Water is a, apparently so sensitive that it is an ever-changing record of subtle influences. And that's the end of that chapter. Vesper, hey! How you doing? I just saw you that you were in. How are you doing tonight? Listening only. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to answer. But thank you for coming in. I'm glad to see you here. Okay. That was interesting. I hadn't heard um, some of that. Um, certainly we know that some water is healthier than other. Um, water with chlorine in it is not as healthy as pure water. We know that. We know that certain minerals in water changes its... Uh, health but it's interesting um, an interesting theory that emotion and environment could affect the water um, I don't know I'll have to think about that one for a while it's an interesting theory though all right so the next article article 18 is the power of water are its secrets the keys to solving today's most vexing problems? It's interesting that we're going into spiritual science and the first two articles are on water. Very interesting. What's the third one? Is about Madame Curie. So that's an interesting shift. Okay. So this one is also by Gene Manning. 
Our thinking apparatus runs on water. Our physical bodies are two-thirds water, so obviously its qualities can heal or harm us. We now learn that water seems to remember and later convey information. No wonder the most dynamic frontier in science today is water research. Or is it research? I wondered after encountering researchers who, and this is a bulleted list, show how neuroscience tends to confirm medieval concepts situating memory, imagination, and reason in water-filled cavities of the brain. Next bullet. Experiment with transferring from water to us the life force energy chi, also called prana, or ki, uh, down through the ages. I also think, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of orgone energy. I think that also translates to chi. Um, I think just the person that invented orgone uh, didn't know anything about chi and called it orgone. Anyway. Um, third bullet point. Study specially shaped water pipes used by the ancient Minoan culture in Crete. Fourth bullet is show how the emanations from healers' hands change water. Fifth is measure physical qualities of holy water or effects of conscious intent upon water's crystalline structure. And the last bullet point is build prototype inventions aimed at using water as a source of energy. Some study the big picture, such as the claim that wa rivers self-organize and energetically recharge themselves through spinning motions, and some point out the well-known anomalies. Water is densest at 4 degrees Celsius, 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit, and strangely expands when it cools further, so that its solid st state floats on top of its liquid state. Water, as the universal solvent, melds with nearly any other element. Water's main ingredient, hydrogen, is spread throughout galaxies and ice is found in dust clouds in outer space. The picture of water that emerges is what Aquarian conspiracy author Marilyn Ferguson calls quote-unquote the strangest stuff around. Learning about the myst mysteries of water evokes a primal foreknowing, like a racial memory. Ferguson wrote a few years ago, quote, pre-science, perhaps pre-science, pre it's hard to read that and convey it, um, something we've known for a very long time. So pre-science, the word, and then the implication is something that predates science. Anyway, <laughs> before our materialistic age lost the abilities to sense subtle energetics, water was central to sacred rituals and symbols. Baptism, the holy river, spiritual visions of the ocean of love, myths of the flood or of creation, drinking of sacred waters when visiting an oracle or a shrine. The Sumerian goddess Inanna had a vase in place of a heart from which flowed miraculous water. The Bronze Age civilization of King Minos at his city of Knossos, Knossos on the island of Crete apparently lived by the principle that water should be returned to the earth in the same condition as it was when it was borrowed, treating all water as holy. Our era, in contrast, treats rivers and oceans as dumping grounds and we face shortages of drinkable water. Dr. Carl Merritt predicts that water will be the currency of the next century. Meanwhile, researchers of water's mysteries struggle for funding. Quote, the quest to understand water hasn't sum summoned up the capital and glamour of space research, Ferguson notes, although it may have more direct bearing on our lives, end quote. While humans burn rainforests and alter other factors that keep our habitat moist, quote, we should remember the nagging suspicion that Mars was once a watery planet, end quote. Let water move, keep it cool. We've had ample warnings. In the 20th century, Austrian forest warden Victor Schauberger 
1885 to 1958, warned about wastelands appearing on our planet when vast forests disappear. He observed water's interaction with the forest, such as the vitality of cold, pure water in tree-sheltered streams. Quote, comprehend nature, nature, then copy nature, end quote, he admonished. He taught that water is a living, rhythmic substance. In maturity, it gives, its, gives of itself to everything needing life. However, water can become diseased through incorrect handling. Dying water harms animals, plants, and fish. Whether stilled by a dam or a bottle, stagnant and warm waters begin to deteriorate. Conversely, at a cool 39 degrees Fahrenheit, moving water is densest, strongest, and at its best carrying capacity. Wild rivers have inherent self-control mechanisms if left alone to establish their own homeostasis. That is, if kept cool with natural overhanging vegetation and allowed to meander around bends and therefore be lively with purposeful swirling motion. Short-sighted human engineering, clear-cut forests, megaproject dams, and rivers confined into canals, tampers with the circulatory system of our planet. Having interfered with the hydrological cycle, we reap floods, droughts, and other extremes of weather. The book Living Water by Olaf Alexanderson introduces Schauberger's insights into river management, water-fueled devices, and energy. Its successor is the book Living Energies by Colum Coates, which could be the textbook for a new eco-technology, how to construct or encourage processes that don't fight nature but instead work in harmony. Coates researched for two decades into Schauberger's discoveries from forestry to flood control to soil fertility and water purification. Reading his book, Hydro Hydrologists could learn how crucial are small variations in temperature in a river. Among Schauberger's observations were how water's spinning motion recharges it with subtle energies. Water power without dams. And there is a picture here. Um, I'll just go ahead and show it. Um, figure 18.1, nature pioneer Victor Schauberger, whose understanding of the nature and dynamics of water still informs environmentalists today. And he's got some kind of a machine. I don't know if it's supposed to be a steam type machine. I don't know. We'll find out maybe. There it is. That's Schoberger. The natural, okay, so water power without dams. The naturalist warning echoes across the decades. Prevailing, quote, prevailing technology uses the wrong form of motion, end quote. 20th century machines leave behind waste products because their processes use the destructive half of nature's cycle of creation destruction. The centrifugal outward moving motions of heat of heating, burning, pushing, radiating, or exploding. They channel air, water, and fuels into the type of motion that nature uses to decompose matter. Schoberger observed that the centripetal inward spiraling force is the creative cooling sucking motion without friction that results in increased order instead of destruction. He applied his understanding of cycloid spiral motion to a wide range of inventions and methods that are in harmony with nature's creative motion. The water magician, quote unquote, had, had solutions for agriculture and energy generation, as well as for transport of water in pipes that encourage water's inward spiraling motion. Schauberger's knowledge in spiral sparking experiments by today's researcher is sparking experiments by today's researchers. For example, some Scandinavians called the Malmo group, I'm sure I butchered that because it's Scandinavian, 
uh, use the phrase self-organizing flow to describe what they are creating. Since Schoberger's technology made use of the natural orderliness spontaneously created by a system under the correct conditions. Meanwhile, new energy generating processes such as Dr. Randall Mills, Mills's black light power convert ordinary water into hydrogen and oxygen. Paul Pantone of Utah runs engines on water mixed with waste substances, and the air that comes out of an exhaust pipe won't dirty a white handkerchief held on the end of the pipe. About a century ago, John Worrell Keeley figured out how to run a motor on the power of cavitation or implosion while alternately compressing and expanding water. He harnessed a phenomenon that we dismiss as a nuisance, the water hammer, quote unquote, in water pipes. Dale Pond, researcher of Keeley's physics, says that Keeley's hydro vacuo motor created a water hammer shock wave that synchronized with the wave's echo quote results in amplitude additive synthesis tremendously increased energy accumulations end quote in quick order pond warns that this resonance amplification is similar to the process that breaks wine glasses okay so then we have two pictures the first one is figure 18.2, John Worrell Keeley, 1837 to 1898, of Philadelphia, was a carpenter and mechanic who in 1872 discovered a new principle for power production via his hydro vacuo engine. Um, and then the second one, 18.3, an illustration used as part of the patent for John Keeley's hydro pneumatic pulsating vacuo engine so here is Keeley and it looks like that might be his engine sitting next to him once it actually focuses and then this one is the oop, turn it there this one is one of the patent drawings come on focus focus there we go It could be his engine there, or a version of it. I don't know. Anyway, do we really know water? Liquid memory. As water science conferences at, at water science conferences that this journalist attended in recent years, the November 1998 conference at semi Semiamhu Resort in Washington State, funded by Living Water International, a privately funded 1997 meeting in Los Angeles organized by Linda McLean and the Institute of Advanced Water Sciences, AWS, symposium the previous year in Dallas. One fact that emerged is that water is not a single homogenous product of nature. Water in living cells has a unique structure and clusters of its molecules have organized relationships another factor is what schauberger called the immature taker versus life-giving mature water since water without minerals is a relentless solvent if we could distill 100% of impurities out of a batch of water, it would be dangerous to drink, leaching minerals from our bones. Then there's the movement vitality factor. Stagnant bottled water, even though chemically clear, is dead compared to water in rushing brooks. But water needs to move properly. As water is pushed through cities in the unnatural confines of metal pipes, its energetic oscillations interfere and the natural order in water structure is canceled. How do we know this? For one, German engineer Theodor Schwenk and his Institute for Flow Science developed a technique for photographing the internal structure of water. In drops of water taken near pristine springs, a symmetric rosetta pattern was revealed. On the other hand, the internal structure of damaged municipal water is chaotic. 
chemical contaminants and electromagnetic pollution compound the damage and cause chaotic clustering of water molecules. No wonder well water tastes so good and city water tastes like shit. <laughs> the participants in the conferences I attended wrestled with questions such as whether living water is an organized state of matter and energy capable of storing and transmitting information. If so, the implications go beyond homeopathy and energy medicine and into the interaction between water and consciousness. Dr. David Schweitzer, grandson of Albert Schweitzer, is the first scientist to photograph the effects of thoughts captured in water. His photographs show that water can act as a liquid memory system capable of storing information. David Schweitzer first stepped onto this trail by becoming an authority on blood analysis. He learned that blood cells express themselves in sacred geometry and other harmonious shapes and colors. Since blood cells hang out in water, he looked further into that substance for answers about our thinking processes. After 10 years of observing blood, in 1996 he made the discovery that opened the door to photographing the stored frequencies in home homeopathics and natural remedies and to researching the impact of positive or negative thoughts on bodily fluids. Quote, having studied the relationship between the brain, cells, and emotions, he told Joseph Dugan in Vancouver, I came to realize that certain trace elements were needed to send information from one area of the brain to another, end quote. Minerals alone could not convey information. To find out if the carrier if the carrier is water itself, Dr. Schweitzer experimented. French scientist Jacques Benveniste had already shed light on the memory of water in homeopathy. He and a dozen other scientists demonstrated that water can retain a memory of molecules it once contained. In 1988, Nature magazine published their experiments showing that if water containing antibodies was diluted repeatedly until it no longer contained a single molecule of antibody, immune cells still responded to the water. The publication drew outrage from orthodox professors, and the magazine later sent a team to Benvenista's laboratory, including the magician James Randi and Walter, Walter Stewart, a self-appointed investigator of scientific fraud. The team judged the French scientist's results to be a delusion. However, a recent book by Michel Schiff says that slander of Benveniste was the delusion. Dr. Schweitzer says aspects of the homeopathic research couldn't be measured by the investigator's instruments. The witch hunt in France didn't stop him from radically thinking from radical thinking. He remembered Albert Einstein's idea that particulate light bodies, quote unquote, also known as somatids, act in ways that we don't yet understand. Waking up one morning with insights on how to make these light bodies visible, Schweitzer began working on a fluorescent microscope at a certain intensity of light. He wanted to see somatids change in response to thought and other influences. Just before the water on the microscope slides evaporated, he saw certain formations develop, quote, dependent on the thoughts or energy atmosphere it had been impregnated with. I observed that this cluster could be modified at will, end quote. Further work showed that microscopic light bodies in the water intensify in the presence of positive thoughts. They shine brightly if thoughts are backed up by emotion, and it makes a big difference whether the emotions are negative or positive. Intrigued by the tiny light bodies, he tested holy waters of religious faiths from Italy, Russia, Yugoslavia, and North America, and saw somatids floating even after years of being bottled on shelves. Quote, this means there is an ideal balance with the somatids never touching each other, which gives them the greatest capacity to store information, end quote. 
However, in studying homeopathic remedies, he learned that careful storage of energy medicines is crucial. French allergist Jacques Benveniste had learned that electronic circuits can impress lasting information upon water, and low-frequency electromagnetic radiation and heat destroy homeopathic strength. Further, Dr. Schweitzer has a warning about purified water that we buy in clear plastic bottles that have been exposed to fluorescent lighting. When we drink only this water, our lips dry out and become chapped and cracked. Quote, Normally, drinking water does not dry out the mouth, but fluorescent lighting changes the structure of water such that it dries out the mucous membranes, end quote. Randy Zicenus, Zicenus of Edmond, Oklahoma, says anyone can personally improve the water he or she uses. Quote, it's amazing what happens when you just take a glass of water and hold it between the palms of your hands and ask your higher self to work with that water and whatever you need for your highest good and then drink it. Incredible what that little ritual does. End quote. Zycenus is president of Biocom, a company that specializes in developing development of biotechnology using radio frequencies, RF, to alter water's bonding structure. He says, quote, if you drink water that's harmonious to the human body, the water will pass through the body within 10 to 15 minutes. Then you've got to go to the restroom. The harmonious water will carry out toxins, end quote. One of his inventions condenses water from air, quote, that's one of the biggest things I've been working on, using frequencies to draw moisture out of air, end quote. He and researchers from Los Alamos National Laboratory are working on, quote, a program where you can take a photocell device, put it out in the desert, and, it will, and it'll make a gallon of water overnight, end quote. The unit is powered by photovoltaics, electricity from sunlight. Zicenus agrees with Dr. Schweitzer's claim that our AC electricity leaves a harmful imprint on water. Hmm, I wonder what Tesla would have to say about that. William Tiller. At the Living Water Conference, Professor Emeritus William Tiller uh, quietly obliterated the conventional view that humans cannot meaningfully interact with their experiments. Quote, conventional science would even more emphatically state that specific human intentions could not be focused into a simple electronic device, which is then used to meaningfully influence an experiment in accord with the specific intention. We have made a valid test and have found the conventional science conclusion to be in serious error." End quote. In his work, Dr. Tiller describes the people who are capable of sustaining high coherence intentions as imprinters. A group of them, for example, sat around a table while putting out the intention, quote, to activate the indwelling consciousness of the system, end quote, so that the pH of the experimental water would increase or decrease significantly compared to the control. It did. How does he explain this? The theory used by Tiller and co-researcher Walter Dibble Jr. is multidimensional. These scientists see water as a special material, quote, well suited for information slash energy transfer from this frequency domain into our conventional domain of cognition the physical end quote regarding the factor of mental capability whether imprinters know enough science to visualize changes in ph dr tiller said quote the unseen intelligence of the universe is an even more important factor end quote Later, he added, in my view, or, quote, in my view, it's the spark of spirit in the cells that gives rise to the life force, end quote. Another scientist at that meeting, Dr. Glenn Rhine, points out that physicists know about the existence of energy fields with properties that are not explained by classical equations. He refers to the non-classical fields as quantum fields. Rhine's work again shows that this non-electromagnetic energy 
information from the primordial vacuum of space, can be stored in water and later communicate with living cells. Perhaps Victor Schoberger's most startling observation was that subtle qualities of water can affect human men humans mentally and spiritually, influencing either the revitalization or deterioration of society. Dr. Thomas Narvaez has proved to his own satisfaction that a vitality factor exists and can be increased or decreased in water by human activity. Quote, we now see that our thoughts not only affect our own bodies, but also the bodies of those around us. Members of this group, speaking to the Institute of the Advanced Water Sciences, who bottle water or who work with broadcasted energies like crystals or magnets, therefore have a responsibility to keep our view of the world upbeat and positive. End quote and end article. Interesting. Um, I don't really have anything to add. Just interesting. Okay. Do I want to read another one tonight? Let's see how long it is. Hmm. Mm. It's five pages. I can get through that tonight. My voice is still doing all right. So this is Article 19, Madame Curie and the Spirits. What are we to make of the strange alliance between a Nobel Prize winning scientist and a notorious medium by John Chambers? Okay, this should be interesting. The contrast between the medium and the female scientist in attendance at her seance could hardly have been greater. The year was 1905, the place, the Psychological Institute in Paris, France. The medium was Eusapia Palladino, the dominant European psychic of her day, and the first to be examined exhaustively by many of the world's leading scientists. The female attendee was Mary Curie, the first woman to achieve worldwide fame as a scientist, and in 1903, a co-winner with Henri Becquerel, I think, and her husband, Pierre, of the Nobel Prize in Physics for their work on radioactivity. In 1911, Mary Curie would receive a second Nobel Prize, this time in chemistry, for discovering radium and polonium and for isolating radium. Eusapia Palladino, born in 1854 in the mountain village of Minervo Murges, I know I butchered that, Italy, uh, could neither read nor write. In childhood, she hit her head so badly that there was a hole in her skull, which pulsed when she was in a trance. According to the savants, the fall was responsible for her fits of hysteria, sleepwalking, epilepsy, and catalepsy. Her mother died giving birth to her, her father was murdered when she was eight, and her grandmother abused her and put her out to work as a servant girl when she was 14. Eusapia spoke a gutter Italian, and when in trance, a bizarre mixture of Italian and French that was almost incomprehensible. Tempestuous, usually in a towering rage, this non-educable psychic hated to bathe, loved to drink, and was constantly seducing sailors. Quite a woman. The world-famous scientist who held Eusapia's hand at the seances in 1905 couldn't have been more different. Mary Curie, Nemanja Sklodowska, was born in uh, Warsaw, Poland in 1867. She was raised by loving, highly intelligent, and cultivated parents. Her mother was a gifted pianist and headmistress of a girls' school, while her father was an impoverished scientist and an under 
under inspector and teacher in a Russian government run high school. As an adult student in Paris, Mary spoke, read, and wrote Polish, French, Russian, and German, and had in-depth knowledge of other languages. She finished first in her master's degree physics program at the Sorbonne at age 25 and second in the math program for a second master's degree at age 26. Both times, she was the first woman to complete the program. She completed a doctorate from the Sorbonne at age 36, but almost as an afterthought since she, her major scientific discoveries were behind her. Mary moved with ease among the greatest minds of her time. Through unorth Though unorthodox and liberated in all her thinking, she conducted herself with propriety. Except for one passionate love affair two years after her husband's death with the brilliant but married scientist Paul Langevin. She authored several books, including her autobiography in English. Before we go on, there is a picture. Figure 19.1, born in Naples, Italy, Eusapia Palladino, 1854 to 1918, was a prominent psychic of her day whose power intrigued Marie Curie. And there is the lovely woman that hated to bathe and loved to drink and seduce sailors. Uh, okay, no comment, I guess. Mary Curie was pretty, Eusapia Palladino was not. The wisp of a <clears throat> Polish girl, <clears throat> excuse me, the wisp of a Polish girl had a porcelain complexion, gossamer ash blonde hair, high cheekbones, and intense gray eyes that were kind when they were not lost in thought. Mary's perfect posture brought out the fetching slimness of her figure, slender ankles, slender wrists, and a nar very narrow waist. A certain austerity, even a grimness, came to mask her features and slow her gait as she grew older, but she never lost the delicate beauty of her physical appearance. Eusapia Palladino, on the other hand, was physically unattractive. She was short, tended to fat, swathed herself in black, and walked with a waddle. Her mouth was twisted in a permanent downward curve that expressed... Uh, and he has this... or she, He has this in... Uh, disdain, question, sarcasm, question, suffering, question. Nobody knew. Her eyes sunk in a double-chinned bulldog face, crackled in their depths with a sinister fire that presaged her sudden explosions of fury. Eusapia's unchained sexuality gave her a vibrant, allure, but the scientists searching for occult energies in her found this easy to ignore. What did Eusapia Palladino do? Things that made her seem to come from a different planet in comparison with Mary Curie. Deborah Blum describes her activities in Ghost Hunters, William James, and the Search for Scientific Proof of Life After Death, um, Penguin Press, 2006. Quote, she made furniture fly. She caused marks to appear on paper by merely extending her hand. Tied to a chair, she caused fingerprints to appear in a smooth block of clay across a room. During one seance in Genoa, lights glittered overhead like dancing fireflies. One light settled on the palm of an observer, a German engineer. End quote. Eusapia made objects appear out of nowhere. She orally... Aurally, a u r a l l y. I know what the word is, but I've only ever read it, so pronouncing it, I'm not sure. Um, she orally channeled utterances from the spirits. She performed automatic writing. She extended her body ectoplasmically, quote unquote, touching others with non-material arms. Before I go on, there's another picture. This one of Mary Curie. Figure 19.2, world-famous scientist Mary Curie, 1867 to 1934. I don't think this picture does her great justice compared to this description the guy had of her. Uh, 
Okay, go back to the text. She did much more, and she did it all intermittently, unexpectedly, never under duress, and not infrequently, fraudulently. To the end of their days, the distinguished scientists in attendance remained bitterly divided about the nature of her achievements. Why did Mary Curie become involved with this? Deborah Blum answers the question on the op-ed page of the New York Times for December 30th, 2006. And this is a quite an extensive quote. Quote, the scientific study of the supernatural began in the late 19th century in synchrony with the age of energy. It's hardly coincidental that as traditional science began to reveal the hidden potential of nature's powers, magnetic fields, radiation, radio waves, electrical currents, paranormal, paranormal researchers began to suggest that the occult operated in similar ways. A fair number of these occult explorers were scientists who studied nature's highly charged circuits. Marie Curie, who did come, who did some of the first research into radioactive elements like uranium, attended seances to assess the powers of mediums. She so did the British physicist J.J. Thompson, who demonstrated the existence of the, of the electron in 1897, and so did Thomas. Tom Thompson's colleague, John Strutt, Lord Raleigh, who won the 1904 World Prize in Physics for his work with atmospheric gases. Raleigh would later become president of the British Society for Psychical Research, and he would be joined in that organization by other physicists, including the wireless radio pioneer Sir Oliver Lodge, who proposed that both telepathy and ghostly appearances were achieved through energy transmissions connecting living minds to one another and perhaps even to the dead. End quote. So that was from that article. We have an eyewitness account of Eusapia Palladino's se seance that Marie Curie attended. She and Pierre attended a number in 1905. It comes from Charles Rickett, R Rich Richette, R R-I-C-H-E-T, Nobel Prize winner in physiology in 1913 and a leading contemporary European researcher into occult phenomena. And again, it's an extensive quote. Quote, the seance took place at the Psychological Institute at Paris. There were present only Madame Curie, Madame X, a Polish friend of hers, and P. Cortier, the secretary of the institute, Madame Curie was on Eusapia's left, myself on her right, Madame X a little farther off, taking notes, and Madame uh, and Monsieur Cortier still further at the end of the table. Cortier had arranged a double curtain behind Eusapia. The light was weak, but sufficient. On the table, Madame Curie's hand holding Eusapia's could be distinctly seen. Likewise, mine also holding the right hand. We saw the curtain swell out as if pushed by some large object. I asked to touch it. I felt the resistance and seized a real hand, which I took in mine. Even through the curtain, I could feel the fingers. I held it firmly and counted 29 seconds, during all which time I had leisure to observe both of Eusapia's hands on the table to ask Madame Curie if she was sure of her control. After the 29 seconds, I said, I want something more. I want uno, uh, uno aneo, a ring. At once, the hand made me feel a ring. It seems hard to imagine a more convincing experiment. In this case, there was not only the materialization of a hand, but also of a ring. End quote. What was Mary Curie's reaction to this seance? We don't know, but we do know the reaction to the Eusapia Palladino's seances of her husband, Pierre Curie, a scientist whose distinguished accomplishments in the fields of piezoelectricity, symmetry in physical phenomena, magnetism, and later radio radioactivity made him a power in his own right. Excuse me. Excuse me. 
Maurice Goldsmith writes, quote, The Curies, especially Pierre, believed in spiritualism. Pierre felt Palandino worked under scientifically controlled conditions. After a seance at a Society for Psychical Research, where in a brightly lit room with no possible accomplices, he watched as tables mysteriously lifted into the air, objects flew across the room, and invisible hands pinched and caressed him. He wrote George Goy, I hope we are able to convince you of the reality of the phenomena, or at least some of them. Um, end quote. It's maybe not done right. I think that's the end of the quote. And then and there's another quote starting in the next paragraph. A few days before his death, Pierre had written of his last Palladino seance. There is here, in my opinion, this is a quote within the quote, there is here, in my opinion, a whole domain of entirely new facts and physical states in space of which we have no conception. End of that quote within the quote. In 1910, four years after Pierre's death, when Mary was rejected by the Academy of Sciences, Henri Poincaré wrote that Pierre's, I know I butchered that, wrote that Pierre's spirit had come to Mary and tried to com comfort her by saying, you will be elected next time. End quote. There was a moment when a belief in the afterworld seemed to burst suddenly, achingly, out of Mary Curie. This was when Pierre, whom she passionately loved, and who by every account was an exceptionally good man, as well as an exceptionally good scientist, died suddenly in a traffic ac accident in Paris on April 19, 1906. He had slipped while absentmindedly crossing a street in the rain. His head was crushed between beneath the wheels of a heavy carriage and he died almost immediately he was 47 mary never came close to recovering from this loss some 24 years later when she sat down to reconstruct a chronology of her life she wrote that on april 19 1906 quote i lost my beloved pierre and with him all hope and all support for the rest of my life end quote in the days following Pierre's death, she wrote in a private diary, which became public knowledge m only many years later, heart-wrenching words that, albeit torn from her in the moment of awful shock, suggest her belief in the spirit world was more than passing. Quote, I put my head against the coffin, she wrote. I spoke to you. I told you that I loved you and that I had always loved you with all my heart. It seemed to me that from this cold contact on my forehead with the casket, something came to me, something like a calm and an intuition that I would yet find the courage to live. Was this an illusion or was this an accumulation of energy coming from you and condensing in the closed cas casket, which came to me as an act of charity on your part? End quote. And I'm almost done with the article, but there's one more picture I'm going to go ahead and show and then I'll finish it. Figure 19.3, Pierre Curie, noted scientist and beloved husband of Mary Curie, who tragically, who was tragically killed in 1906. And there we have it. There it focused. Okay. She added, quote, I sometimes have the absurd, absurd idea that you are going to come back. Didn't I have it yesterday when hearing the sound of the front door closing, the absurd idea that it was you, end quote. The death of Pierre Curie was the greatest tragedy of Mary Curie's life. She bore it with a grim and bitter fortitude. She had been schooled in fortitude. Tragedy was almost the lot of every pole in Europe in the 19th century. After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in 1815, Poland had been ceded to Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Russia abolished Poland's name and for the next century sought to absorb the country into itself. The Poles would not regain their sovereignty until the end of, the wor of World War I. Two unsuccessful uprisings against the Russians carried out in 1830 and in 1863 made matters worse. The vindictive Russians did not allow higher education for British women. 
British, for Polish women, sorry. Mary, thirsty for knowledge, pursued her education in clandestine flying classes or by herself. Eking out enough money through governess jobs to come to Paris, she spent her years of study in an unheated garret room. <clears throat> Excuse me. Garret room, subsisting on small portions of tea, chocolate, bread, and fruit, and sleeping only a few hours at a time as she studied day and night. <clears throat> I don't know what a garret room is. I'll have to look that up. Achievement brought awards and grants her way, but her heroic years of endeavor had steeled her against adversity, even while they taught her to discount nothing and to reach out in every direction. If this hard-headed woman of genius who chose to spend precious time with Eusapia Palladino, perhaps that's an invitation to us to give this unruly medium of genius at least the benefit of the doubt. And that is the end of that article, and my voice is done. That will take us into um, Article 20 for next time. India's Mystic Military. Are fleeing Tibetan monks changing the balance of power on the Indian subcontinent? By John Kettler. So we will get into that next time. That sounds like it could be an interesting one, too. And I'm going to have to look up what a garret room is. G-A-R-R-E-T. But that'll be it for tonight. Um, let's see. Who have we got around? Mr. Blitzer's on playing Horizon Zero Dawn. Zeus is on. Um, oh, nope. Mr. Blitzer just disappeared. Oh, no, no, he didn't. He just jumped down to the bottom of the list instead of the top. That's odd. Um, let me see. Ren's on. Mm, hot dog is on. Let's go on over to Mr. Blitzer. Why not? I will take us on over there and I will see you in just a minute.